So welcome uh, everybody to this uh, uh, session on left uh, uh, treatment of left main coverage versus PCI for the TCTAP uh, uh, 2021 virtual. It is my uh, privilege and honor to co-chair this session with Dr. David Holmes. We have a terrific group of uh, uh, speakers and panelists from all around the world and I look forward to the debate. So in the interest of uh, time, the first uh, uh, speaker of this session will be David Holmes uh, uh, himself. He will uh, introduce the section with his uh, 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 introductory keynote. Dr. Holmes, thank you. Mario, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with this incredibly good and important group. As we think about this very important topic, we, we must need to take into consideration why is it so controversial? You would think after all this length of time since we've known about left main disease that we would have all the answers. But as we will see in this incredibly good debate, why it is remains so controversial. Next slide. Can I go to my next slide? There are two very different procedures as we think about it. We will hear about the surgical approach and then we will try to compare and contrast that with data from the alternative approach. And I think it is fair to say that's alternative, but I think it's a complementary approach as we think about it going forward, because the next approach is quite different. And there will be advantages and disadvantages to both of these approaches. As we think about the controversy, it is sort of like the cartoon that is seen here, where we have several blind people who are trying to decide what they are feeling. If you are feeling a trunk, you might say, well, this is a siphon, this is a hose. Other people might say something, I'm feeling something that's really sharp. I, I don't know what that is exactly, but it's long and it's pointed. And we have then another person that feels another part of this structure that they are feeling. And all together, when they open their eyes, they realize that it's an elephant, not just a trunk, not just a, a tusk, not just an ear, but it's an elephant. And so part of the confusion and the controversy about this field is that we all see it quite differently, depending upon our individual perspectives and our patients also see it somewhat differently depending upon their individual perspectives. There are things that we know about this field. We do know that we do not outgrow coronary artery disease. It's going to be with us for the duration. However long that duration is, it's going to be with us. And in contrast to what sometimes people think that by virtue of a procedure, they're gonna get over it. They're not gonna get over it. In contrast, we need to learn how to manage it. And that's the second bullet point. The third bullet point is that we have learned increasingly about patient expectations and they vary. The specific endpoints of their expectations as well as the timeline of their expectations. For example, as we talk with patients, if we talk about 10 year data and 10 year follow up, the patient is going to say, well, by the end of 10 years, I will have stopped smoking. I'll be exercising every day. My blood pressure will be perfect and I will never have eaten another egg or had something that had a lot of sugar in it. And so their specific endpoints are very different. Now, if another endpoint that they look forward is how quickly can I get back to work or can I get out of hospital? Then that's a different expectation and they will find different things when they try to feel what the elephant looks like. And then the timeline we've talked about, is it going to be tomorrow? Is it going to be next year? Is it going to be in 10 years time or longer? And the final piece of information that we know is that optimal medical therapy is of foundational importance. In the past, sometimes patients said, 
well, I've now had the treatment. I don't need that medicine anymore. In the past, sometimes surgeons said, well, we've now treated this. I'm not sure what the patient is going to be taking. Is that important? Probably, maybe, may, may not be. And the interventional cardiologist said, well, I can always see you again if you have problems. But we realized that optimal medical therapy needs to be continued. And that has now been shown to be beneficial at five years and at 10 years that Patrick will talk about, that we need to continue with that and not forget those important foundational elements. There's been a long history of controversy, and the controversy that we share today is part of that long history. We remember from 1974 through 1979, we had the CAS trial. There were 1,400, almost 1,500 patients with left main coronary disease with a stenosis greater than 50%. Now, at that point in time, it's hard to know what it was. Was it 70% or was it 40% or was it 30%? But they found that overall coronary bypass graft surgery was better than medical therapy. That was statistically significantly better and clinically importantly better. With the exception of those patients that had moderate stenosis and normal or just slightly abnormal LV, in which case the treatment of left main disease wasn't any better if you went surgery or if you went with medical therapy. So that was the first controversy. That dates back to the earliest days of interventional cardiology and cardiovascular surgery in this left main coronary artery disease space. Interventional cardiology has been part of that long history. It is true that in 1978, Grunzig performed balloon angioplasty in 50 patients with left main disease. That was over a period of 18 months within the first year of having initially performed the procedure. What did he found? He found that indeed the early results looked pretty good, but there were the issues of acute or subacute closure, vessel closure, there was elastic recoil, and then restenosis. And so at that point in time, rather than saying, well, there are different patients who might benefit from it. The, the decision and the recommendation was, well, maybe hold off on it for now. And so we have seen controversies as part of the long history of the process of care for this specific disease. What are some of the controversies that we will hear in the debate this morning? We're going to hear and address these controversies. They will include the heterogeneity of anatomic groups. Are, dealing, are we dealing with osteal lesions? Are we dealing with mid-shaft lesions? Is it a long left main? Are we dealing with distal lesions with bifurcation or trifurcation involvement? Is there heterogeneity that makes a difference in terms of what strategy we recommend? The next controversy relates to subsets of patients. Are we talking about patients in registries or in randomized clinical trials? It, those are different pieces of information. We might get different results depending upon whether we're looking at registries versus randomized clinical trials. The next controversy relates to the length of follow-up. And we talked a little bit about that in terms of patient expectations but also in terms of our professional expectations. We now have the 10-year follow-up for syntaxes and for PCI with older drug-eluting sense. That's true, but it's now 10-year follow-up, and there wasn't any difference in all-cause mortality with left main. Now, we can further say about the length of follow-up that we don't have a huge number of patients. And that will be talked about during the debate that the syntaxes trial of left main involvement was a relatively small number of patients. But that's the information that we have. And that's the information that we need to talk about as we begin to have conversations with our patients and their families about what might be the best strategy of care to recommend. The next controversy, we're not through with controversies, and we will then address these. What will be the best endpoint, and at what time do we measure that endpoint? Is it going to be all-cause death, or is it going to be cardiac death, or is it potentially going to be 
sudden cardiac death. As we think about cardiac death, we need to remember that all death is sudden. One moment you're alive and the next you're dead. But does that matter in terms of what we define as the endpoint of cardiac death? How about stroke? Well, we have the Nobel trial. Um, nobody necessarily agrees with that or finds that to be plausible, but that's a, an endpoint that has been studied and has been published and we've talked about. How about the endpoint of repeat intervention, realizing that that may change as technology gets better? For example, it would be said that the Syntaxis trial included very old technology. We don't use that anymore. Well, we don't use that anymore, but we don't have 10-year follow-up of the things that we do use now. How about the endpoint of quality of life if we choose, choose that, when do we measure it? Do we measure quality of life at six weeks or at one year or at six months? How about return to work? Does it matter when they return to work? When patients return to work, it matters a great deal to them. But if that is the metric that we are comparing these two different treatment strategies, we have to keep that in mind. And finally, then the days in hospital. If we were going to say the most important thing is to get you out of the hospital early on, well, that's going to give you a different answer to the controversy about dilatation, intervention versus surgical approach. And the final issue that is terribly important is their catch-up. And the syntaxis trial is terribly important as are trials in dealing with other technologies in left main disease. Does it matter? Is there a difference between three years and five years? Is something that you measure at three years, do the curves cross? over the next two years or over the next seven years. And that issue of catch up, patients seize upon that as we talked about, that the patients believe that by the end of 10 years, they will be incredibly much more healthy because they've decided to stop smoking, decided to get up early at 4.30 in the morning and exercise and keep their blood pressure under control. And does that catch up matter? How do we put that into the equation of taking care of patients? The list of controversies continues. For interventional cardiologists, there are the stint strategy controversies. Are we going to all use DK crush as they would do in Korea and Japan and China? Or are there other strategies? How about stent type? Does that matter? Well, we have the information on tax stents, which are of sort of historical interest. There's the controversy about graft strategy. We need to realize that there is information that one of the panelists has identified is that having two mammary arteries doesn't buy you anything more than having one mammary artery as a revascularization con conduit. We know that that graft strategy makes a great deal of difference for those occasional patients. They're infrequent, and David will probably talk about that um, in terms of sternal wound infections. Is there a difference between those? Is there a difference between death and the graft strategy, whether you get one or two mammary arteries? Is there a difference in diabetics? Do diabetic women have more problems and do we need to keep that in, in consideration? How about the other, the next controversy about long-term therapy? What are we going to do with these patients out to 10 years or longer? Are we going to ensure that they're on dual antiplatelet therapies? Are we going to ensure that potentially we switch them to a DOAC instead of aspirin and Plavix? And we'll talk about that. The next controversy is going to be, does the data that is going to be discussed pertain to protected left main or not? Many centers are doing unprotected left main. Some are saying we should only do protected left main, but we will then have to think about that in this debate format because we have to be specific about which patient group we're looking at. And the final piece of information, or one of the final pieces of information, relates to the controversy of coronary dominance. Does it matter to the interventional cardiologist or to the surgeon in a patient with unprotected left main, whether it's right coronary dominant 
or whether it's balanced coronary dominance or left coronary dominance. And how do we factor that in when we talk with the patient and the family about what the recommendation for optimal care should be? We've then talked about many of the controversies and some of the areas that will be explored during this next debate in which we will weigh the pros and cons, the balance, the risk balance with PCI versus coronary surgery. I look forward to addressing these controversies, these very difficult components of care as we take about, as we talk about making sure that we're providing the best recommendation for the individual patient in front of us. So we look forward to the debate. I think it'll be terribly exciting. And so we will then start with Patrick Saroyes, followed by then Dr. David Taggart, and then the chance for there to be a, a robust question answer discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Oms. So I think, uh, Dr. Sir Luis, uh, I think uh, uh, you can now uh, uh, start and explain to uh, us and uh, everyone that is listening when uh, PCI is better. Thank you, Mauro. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a debate, but uh, let me uh, allow me to make some preliminary statement. I'm not in favor of PCI treatment for revascularization of uh, left main disease. I'm not in favor of cabbage treatment for revascularization of left main disease. I am in favor of the best and safest individualized prognosis for maize and all cause mortality when I have to select a revascularization treatment for my patient with left main disease. This is uh, published last year in the European Heart Journal, the five years mortality after PCI of cabbage for left main coronary disease, a meta-analysis of four randomized uh, trial, noble syntax, Excel and pre-combat. On the left-hand side, all-cause mortality. On the right-hand side, uh, cardiac death. We may challenge the result of cardiac death since they are the product of a human adjudication but we cannot challenge all-cause mortality. The count of dead bodies is an unbiased assessment. And the verdict here is quite simple, clear and loud. There is no difference in all-cause mortality for left main treatment between PCI and cabbage. Hazard ratio of 1.05 for all-cause mortality, hazard ratio 1.03 for cardiac death. I can stop my talk here and uh, hand the debate, uh, but let us add a little bit granularity to this uh, bold uh, statement for the sake of uh, your entertainment. Randomized trial, controlled trial as the gold standard for testing the effectiveness of novel treatment. Average treatment effects are typically reported in randomized trial. However, However, treatment effect, uh, effectiveness can vary across individual patients. Average treatment effect may be suboptimal for decision making in individual patients. The Syntax score 2 published in The Lancet in 2013, derived from two angiographic and six clinical variables, provided at that time an individualized decision making based on all four years cause mortality after either bypass of PCI. And using the data of the 10 years follow-up of syntax extended survival, syntaxes, we sought to update the syntax score to the 2020 published in the Lancet also for prediction of 10 years all cause death and five years maze and to externally validate in randomized trial, freedom, best pre-combat, Excel, the syntax stock uh, 2 2024 is ability to predict treatment 
benefit in mortality and maize. And what is new to also externally validate in a registry, more contemporary, the Credo uh, Kyoto registry. This is a typical example of an average treatment effect as a summary result. Um, All-cause mortality after cabbage was uh, 24.5 in the syntax, and after PCI was uh, 28.4 with an hazard ratio of 1.19, an average increased risk of 19% with a p-value of 0.066. Based, the question is the following, on the basis of the average treatment effect, should you send all your patient to surgery? And the answer is of course, no. Today, we are developing decision tool to improve personalized care in cardiovascular disease and moving the heart of medicine towards science. Because the average treatment effect is assessed in an heterogeneous population, some patients in green on the cartoon are expected to benefit from the alternative treatment. Some in blue are expected to have an equipoise result, and some in red are expected to be armed by the new treatment. And the average effect is a kind of multicolor patient, the sum of, all, of these three different types of patient. Now, if you can identify the heterogeneous response to the treatment, then we can segregate and identify patients who will benefit from the treatment, those who will be armed by the treatment, and those who are expected to have an equivocal response. The Syntax Score 2020 has been recently redeveloped and published in The Lancet. We have now seven prognostic factors, age, creatinine clearance, ejection fraction, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, COPD, current smoking, as well as two effect modifier, the anatomical Syntax Score, and the type of disease, either left main or uh, three vessel disease. And the probability formula predicting 10 years mortality is at the bottom of the slide. One formulation is dedicated to cabbage in blue if the patient is going to undergo a cabbage. The other formulation with specific parameter for PCI in red has to be used if a patient is going to undergo PCI. And clearly a very similar formula is applied to the predicted occurrence of a five years maze. This slide show cross validation of the 10 years mortality model in the syntaxes with 1800 patients. On the left hand side, we have two linear relationship between the observed mortality and the predicted mortality respectively for the PCI in red and cabbage in blue, applying the model create either for PCI or cabbage. The whole patient population of the trial are subdivided in quartile and the linear relationship called calibration plot are quite spectacular if you look at the slope close to zero and the intercept close to zero. On the right hand side, we have the difference in mortality, otherwise called uh, treatment uh, benefit. On the vertical axis, the observed treatment benefit of cabbage versus PCI. On the horizontal axis, the predicted treatment benefit of cabbage versus PCI. And it's also a pretty nice almost linear relationship. PCI is basically better in the first quarter of the population. In the second quarter, we observe equipoise between cabbage and PCI for mortality. In the last two quarter, the half of the population, cabbage is better. And that can be translated in Kaplan-Meier curve. In the first quarter of the population, survival of PCI in red is better than the cabbage arm in blue. 
in the second quarter of the population, there is an equipoise and perfect overlap and superposition of the mortality curve of PCI and cabbage. In the third and fourth quartile, the curve of survival are separate and diverging with better survival after cabbage. So in terms of uh, treatment benefit, the absolute risk difference in mortality in the first quarter was minus 1.4 for PCI. In the second quarter, the benefit of surgery was close to zero. In the third quartile, the treatment benefit for surgery was 6.1. And in the last quarter, the treatment benefit is 11.4 in favor of cabbage. This slide shows a similar approach for the maize rate at five years. It's somewhat more difficult to predict maize than mortality, but uh, treatment benefit could be externally family, uh, validate in the pool population consisting of the freedom with multivessel disease and diabetes, best with multivessel disease, pre-combat and excel with left main. Now the next slide will show you the application of the Syntax Core 2 available in uh, smartphone and Android and uh, website. Uh, and it is for the individualized decision-making in three cases. So in the first case, the patient is 70 years old, has a reduced creatinine, a clearance of 39 ml, and a reduced ejection fraction of 40%, and is uh, a current smoker without COPD and peripheral vascular disease with left main, with left main, but a very low anatomical syntax score of uh, 11. 10 years mortality is 58% with PCI and 68% with cabbage. Five years maize is 30% with PCI and 44% with cabbage. PCI should be a preferred modality of revascularization. In the second case, relative young patient with diabetes, but non-insulin dependent with a borderline creatine clearance and a normal ejection fraction without COPD and peripheral vascular disease with a very simple three vessel disease represented by a low anatomical syntax score of 10. In this case, there is equipoise between PCI and cabbage in terms of mortality at 10 years. You could see that 11% and 10% and maize at five years, 9.3 and 8.4. Probably PCI will be a select. In the third case, the patient is 69 old, has insulin-dependent diabetes and a normal creatinine clearance with a complex and extensive coronary disease represented by a very high anatomical syntax score of 50. The difference of 20% in both 10 years mortality and five year maize in favor of cabbage makes cabbage the ethical and mandatory choice of prevascularization. Following the publication, The Lancet, we received the following correspondence from uh, Nicola Fremantle and Domenico Pagano. I'm reading, um, why have the authors developed their model using data which are known to be biased toward PCI for left main disease and validate the analysis of two high positive trials for multivessel disease and one small neutral trial for left main. The new score may be best read as a cynical attempt, sick in the text, by the authors to hold back the tide of long-term evidence that left main disease is not demonstrated to be different in response to cabbage or PCI. I made the following answer. I said at the time of the submission to the Lancet, February 25, 2020, we had not been given any access to the Excel trial data by the industrial sponsor. The corresponding author requested access to a trim database of the Excel trial necessary to construe the new score and the data became available on May the 4th, 2020. 
following the industrial sponsor approval to send the data outside the CRO in New York. We present now in the responding letter to Pagano published in the Lancet, the result of the external validation of the CTAT score to 2020 in patient include in the freedom, best free combat and Excel trial. So that slide showed the external validation, the freedom, best pre combat and Excel for five years maze, the calibration of the relationship between predicted and observed maze rate was very good in PCI and in cabbage. And even after inclusion of the Excel trial, the predictability of the five years maze difference was still very reliable. Now, syntax score is based on 10 years follow-up, but relying on an outdated device and outdated technique of implantation. So the last question is, is the predictive value of the redeveloped score still applicable to the current era of PCI and cabbage? Is the score applicable to a non-randomized population belonging to the real world? Recently, having validated the Syntax Core 2020 internally and externally from randomized cohort of patients, we decide to explore non-randomized cohort of patients in the Credo Kyoto, led by my good friend Takeshi Kimura. Uh, in cohort two, between January 2005 and December 2007, 1,004 left main were treated, 364 with PCI and 640 with cabbage. In core three, between January 2011 and December uh, 2013, 855 left main were treated, 383 with PCI and uh, 472 with cabbage and both cohorts have follow-up of five years. In cohort three, there are new generation of deaths used in 90.3% of the case, and intravascular imaging was applied in 83.4%. This is my last slide. In the cohort three, the diagram on the left-hand side compared the predicted mortality at five years after cabbage versus the predicted mortality at five years after PCI. In blue open circle, the patient treated with PCI and in red open circle, the patient treated with cabbage. The open circle are more or less equally distributed around the identity line. And on the right-hand side panel, we have the five years death difference, the so-called treatment benefit, the ultimate treatment benefit. And in the first tercile of the population, the treatment benefit was not in favor of cabbage, but in favor of PCI, according to the predicted rate. And indeed the observed mortality with PCI was clearly lower than with cabbage. In the second tercile, there, is, there was no predicted difference in mortality between cabbage and PCI. And indeed, there was no observed difference in mortality between PCI and cabbage. The perfect equipoise in mortality. And in the third tercile of the patient, the predicted treatment benefit in favor of cabbage is confirmed by an observed lower mortality after cabbage when compared to PCI. In other words, the uh, Syntax Core 2020 has the potential to support treatment decision making in left main disease, patient treated with contemporary deaths and the support of uh, intravascular imaging guidance. So in conclusion, using data from the randomized uh, syntaxis trial, we have updated and externally validated the Syntax 2 2020 with the help of SJ Park and the help of Valentin Furster. Uh, and we have now a personalized predictive model based on seven prognostic factors and two 
pre-specified effect modifiers, as the epidemiologists uh, call them. And that's the dis uh, disease type, three vessel of left main, and the anatomical syntax score, which is now 16 years old. And the goal is to predict 10 years old cause death and five year maze for patient treated with either with PCI or cabbage. Now, by providing expected probabilities of five and 10 years outcome, this model may improve the ability of the heart team to inform patient and their families regarding the risk and benefit of alternative treatment for complex CAD, in particular left main coronary artery disease, and support a more transparent shared decision-making process. Thank you very much. That was terrific. We're going to move on um, and hear from Professor David Taggart, who will also then talk about the surgical experience and approaches to personalizing care in patients with left main coronary artery disease. David. Thank you, David, for your <clears throat> generous introduction. And I'd like to start by just briefly thanking Dr. S.J. and Dr. Park Park the, and the other organizers for the invitation to be here. I've been blessed to come to Seoul on many previous occasions and had wonderful experiences in uh, South Korea. I would also like to thank and acknowledge Patrick Sroy, because in fact, I did my first major international debate I don't know if Patrick will remember it, but, but it was in October 2005, 16 years ago, but it was the first time I debated on a major international forum. So I've debated with Patrick many times since then, and it's great. I continue to learn from him every time I hear him talk. But what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes is talk about the debate of left main PCI versus cabbage. I'm going to explain why I still think the evidence is generally in favour of cabbage, but not for every patient. And I will declare my conflicts of interest clinically as a cardiac surgeon. I would point out that for the XL trial, of which I was privileged to be the chairman of the surgical committee, that actually finally withdrew from the final publication, I'd still like to point out that the Oxford cardiologists and surgeons were the second largest recruiters to the XL trial worldwide. And I do have some commercial interests, but none relevant to today's presentation. So in, if you look at left main PCI versus cabbage, in the next 15 minutes, I'd like to cover key issues in interpreting data, say a brief word about PCI versus cabbage in multivessel disease where there is no left main, talk about the changing perspective of PCI in left main disease, some of the recent data from the left main randomized trials, look at the crucial data, survival data at five to 10 years, look at the impact of syntax scores on outcome, the impact of left main location in the impact of repeat revascularization. If we're looking at any evidence base for cabbage versus, 3P, versus PCI, whether for randomized trials or for registry data, or when you're reviewing a manuscript for a journal, I think there are three crucial questions you always need to ask. Are the trial patients actually typical of routine clinical practice in terms of coronary artery disease? And the answer is usually no, because the patients are often highly selected. The duration of follow-up must be an absolute minimum of five years, but as we're looking at a treatment to guide patients over 10, maybe 15 years, I think we should all be aiming for a minimum of 10 years because what we consistently see is that with increasing duration of follow-up, cabbage usually offers better results. And the third thing we need to take account of, as mentioned by David Holmes, is the crucial importance of guideline-directed medical therapy because in many of the PCI cabbage trials, cabbage had better results, but that was despite substantially inferior medical therapy. And had the cabbage patients had better medical therapy, perhaps the results of cabbage would have been even greater. I'm just going to make this brief statement about cabbage versus PCI in multivessel disease without left main. 
and we don't have time to go through the evidence today, but I think there is robust and compelling evidence that cabbage improves survival, it reduces myocardial infarction and the need for repeat revascularization. Its benefits are even greater in patients with diabetes and in those with impaired left ventricular function. But what is the situation for left main disease? I'm going to go back to this paper, which I've shown several times at previous lectures. But if you look at what the, cons the consensus was in 2008, when we reviewed all the evidence for PCI and cabbage and left main disease, we concluded that cabbage should remain the preferred treatment strategy, particularly in good surgical candidates. And that was based on a number of basic observations. Up to 90% of patients with left main have multivessel disease, coronary disease, where cabbage already offers a survival benefit. Up to 90% of left main lesions are distal bifurcation and known to be at higher risk of restenosis. But also in this review, we pointed out that the PCI outcomes for isolated osteo or mid-shaft lesions, left main lesions, were excellent and possibly even better than for cabbage. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then shortly after that review, S.J. Park and his colleagues published this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I have to acknowledge the enormous and sustained contributions from Dr. both S.J. and Dr. Wu Park over a long period of time, now over 25 years, where they have made these very substantial, important contributions to both our understanding and the treatment of left main. And this will become more obvious as I go through my presentation. But essentially what they showed in the main compare registry of over 2,200 patients, of whom roughly half had stents and half had cabbage, was that in a propensity matched analysis at three years, there were similar outcomes for death and the composite of death, MI, and stroke, but much greater target vessel revascularization with stents. And then in 2014, there was publication of the subset of patients in the left in the syntax trial, the 705 patients with left main disease. And you can see that for syntax scores of 0 to 32, the incidence of MACE was really identical between cabbage and PCI. Whereas in patients with syntax scores above 32, cabbage seemed to offer significant benefits. And indeed that was used to define the entry criteria to the XL trial. And I just want to acknowledge the XL trial again, published in the New England Journal in 2019. And this is an important trial because it is the largest, most definitive trial of PCI and cabbage in left main disease. It's important to acknowledge that the patients were relatively selected with syntax scores below 33. There were 1,905 patients randomized, but this was short of the 2,600 where it had already been planned to randomize. And there was never a clear explanation for stopping the trial early. The mean age of the patients was 66 years, and this is really important, but you would anticipate that these patients would have a life expectancy of 15 to 20 years. The mean syntax score was 26, and the primary outcome was a composite of death, MI, stroke, but not revascularization. If you look at what Excel showed us at five years, bearing in mind these were relatively young patients with low and intermediate severity disease, the most worrying feature was death from any cause at five years, an absolute increase in the PCI group by 38%, and it was rapidly accelerating. There was also a significant increase in non-procedural MI and repeat revascularization in the PCI group and no difference in stroke. But the authors concluded in the final sentence of the abstract, in patients with left main coronary artery disease of low or intermediate anatomical complexity, there was no significant difference between PCI and cabbage with respect to the rate of the composite outcome of death, stroke, or MI at five years. But I don't think that conclusion reflected the data that I've just shown. And that's why I withdrew. In fact, shortly after the publication of the paper, Mario Godino and myself sent a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine expressing our concerns about the interpretation of the Excel trial because of the differential and accelerating death rates in the PCI group, the poor definition of adjudicated death, which is open to all kinds of biases, and then the use only of a new untested biochemical definition of MI while simultaneously failing to provide 
the protocol specified universal definition of MI that would have allowed comparison with other trials. And that letter was published eight months after the initial trial. And in the same issue of the New England Journal, the principal investigators then did finally address the issue of the universal definition of MI data. And in contrast to the new biochemical definition of MI, which was higher in the cabbage group, the universal definition showed that with PCI, the hazard ratio for procedural MI was increased by a hazard ratio of 2.4, and for all myocardial infarctions by two. But that data was never presented to the ESCEX guideline task force on myocardial revascularization, nor presented in the original 2016 and 2019 New England Journal publications. And if you look at further exploration of that data in Jack in 2020, again, it showed that the new protocol definition based on a biochemical definition, when compared to the third universal definition of MI, the incidence then dropped by more than three quarters in the cabbage group. And had that been presented in the original analysis, then it would have changed completely the outcome of the XL trial. If you look at the Noble trial, 1,200 patients, if you look, compare their mean age, it was similar to that in XL. The mean syntax score was lower in Noble than XL, and only 15% of patients in Noble had diabetes compared to 30% in XL. And you can see a clear difference in the primary composite endpoint of MACE in favor of cabbage that was both highly clinically and statistically significant, and that was for the individual components of mortality, MI, revascular, revascularization, and stroke. Now, if you look at another important analysis by Stuart Head in The Lancet in 2018, looking at over 4,400 patients with left main from 11 randomized trials, and this was a pooled individual patient data analysis, the mean syntax score was 26, and there was no difference in five-year mortality. Interestingly, in the 25% of patients with diabetes, mortality in the cabbage group was 13.4% versus 16.5% for PCI, and that just failed to reach conventional statistical significance. And this is the 10-year outcome of the extended syntax trial syntaxes, looking at the 705 patients with left main with a mean syntax score of 29, and showing, as we heard from Patrick, no difference in survival at 10 years. If you look at the pre-combat trial, another one of the very first randomized trials from the Assam Medical Center, 600 patients followed to 10 years, no difference in the primary death, I'm sorry, no difference in death from any cause, but in terms of the primary composite outcome, again, no significant difference at 10 years. And the only difference was increased revascularization in the PCI group, is 16% versus 8% for the cabbage group. <clears throat> but this is another important paper from the Assan Medical System, System, now showing a significant increase in mortality with drug eluting stents versus cabbage that is not apparent at five years, but starts to increase between five and 10 years. And that is for death from any cause, the composite of death, Q-wave, MI, and also very large difference in target vessel revascularization. And the same group have shown now, looking at the importance of the location of the left main disease by comparing outcomes in osteolar shaft disease versus distal bifurcation disease. And you can see that for osteal shaft disease, the death from any cause in the composite endpoints in panel C are significantly lower than for the comparable figures for distal bifurcation disease, but also there is no difference between PCI and cabbage that is, for, for distal bifurcation disease, there's a marked increase in mortality with drug eluting stents after five years in the PCI group. And in both groups, osteomid shaft and distal bifurcation disease, again, again, very significant differences in repeat revascularization. And yet in another important paper from the same group, this looks at the impacts of syntax scores on outcomes in patients out to 10 years. And what you can see is that there is a very clear benefit of cabbage in patients with high syntax scores, both from death from any cause and for the composite of death, Q-wave, MR stroke, and for target vessel revascularization. In contrast, 
for PCI, the syntax score is not discriminative. In other words, the higher your syntax score in PCI, the worse all your outcomes are. But this does not happen with cabbage patients. And you must as well be aware from this paper from Excel, looking at any mortality following revascularization in patients in the Excel trial by either PCI or cabbage, showing a consistent increase in the hazard ratio for mortality early, then out to one year, and still beyond one year. So to keep saying that repeat revascularization is a completely benign phenomenon is not accurate. So what should we be, be believe now about left main with the continuing debate? Well, you can look at any number of meta-analyses now that have compared the four or five randomized trials of PCI versus cabbage, and most of them will just repeat the same mantra that there is no difference in mortality or the major outcomes of cardiac death stroke or MI, but there is less repeat revascularization with cabbage. But I think this is a bit of a trick because what these meta-analysis have done is have taken the largest, most definitive trial of left main XL, which showed a clear mortality benefit with cabbage, and they've diluted it with older, weaker, smaller, underpower studied until the mortality benefit that was observed in the XL trial disappears. And another remarkable thing about this particular meta-analysis was the record speed of acceptance to publication. It was 11 days from submission of the original manuscript to review, then to revision, then to resubmission, and then to acceptance. 11 days. Now I'm going to submit all my subsequent manuscripts to that same journal. And then you can take a totally different view of what the meta-analysis or <clears throat> systematic reviews of left made and cabbage show. This is by James Brovey, published in JAMA of in Internal Medicine in July, 2020. Bayesian analysis assisted in RCT data interpretation and specifically suggested whether based on Excel results alone or on the totality of available evidence that PCI was associated with inferior long-term results for all events, including mortality, compared with cabbage for patients with left main coronary artery disease. And this is a subsequent interpret or reinterpretation of Syntax's Excel and Noble by Mario Gaudino and colleagues, which is currently in print, showing that there remains, even in patients with Syntax scores below 33, a significant survival benefit for cabbage over PCI. Here are the current ESC EX guidelines for cabbage and PCI in left main. You can see cabbage is a class 1A indication for every level of Syntax score. For PCI, it's only 1A for syntax scores below 22. It's class three for syntax scores above 33. And the question is, in light of new emerging evidence, will the indication class 2A change for PCI? So I'm going to summarize and conclude by saying that I think for multivessel disease without left main, cabbage is clearly superior for all syntax scores, and especially in patients with diabetes. For left main disease, left main disease, of whom 90, up to 90% also have multivessel disease, I think cabbage is clearly superior for severe disease, syntax scores above 32. I think the two largest, most definitive trials of PCI versus cabbage in low intermediate severity disease showed cabbage to be superior for mortality in the XL trial and non-procedural MI and repeat revascularization in both XL and Noble. I think there is conflicting data about mortality in left main for PCI and cabbage in patients with low and intermediate syntax scores out to five to 10 years, but there is increasing evidence of potential equivalence between the therapies. I think left main location, osteo mid shaft versus bifurcation is vital to subsequent outcomes and cabbage appears superior for bifurcation lesions while PCI may offer equal outcomes in non-bifurcation -bi lesions, and especially in the absence of significant additional proximal coronary artery disease, but there will still be a much higher need for repeat revascularization. And I've already said repeat revascularization is not an entirely benign phenomenon. So I would like to conclude with my personal view, which is I believe that the current data would still suggest a cautious approach 
to the use of stents in patients with low and intermediate severity left main disease, and especially in distal or bifurcation lesions, and particularly in younger patients who would have a long anticipated life expectancy. On that point, I'm going to conclude my talk. I would like to thank both Dr. Duckwoo and SJ Park and the organizers for inviting me to participate. And I'd like to say, it's great to see all the panelists again and thank any audience who are listening. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was uh, terrific. We had a great presentation, a great introduction, and I think now the floor is open for discussion. Uh, I will start with the first question. It seems evident that uh, capture PCI are two very different uh, procedures. Uh, my personal view that it's probably the time to stop discussing CABG versus PCI and to focus on what patient benefit from CABG, what patient benefit from PCI, and are we doing the right? Are we doing a CABG in the right patient and PCI in the right patient? I think this is the most relevant question after almost two decades of uh, randomized and non-randomized comparison of the two interventions, we have a pretty clear idea of the relative benefit and disadvantage on the two interventions. So let's start with my good friend Deepak. Deepak, what, what do you think? What is your What are your thoughts? Shall we stop discussing CABG versus PCI and start discussing when to do CABG and when to do PCI? Oh, uh, thank you for asking. Um, first of all, I've got to congratulate the speakers. These were really excellent talks. I think the debates are always challenging because I think all these speakers really are more in the middle and in yes. fact are trying to do what's best for their patients, realizing that there's PCI and cabbage and also medical therapy for stable patients. Uh, obviously unstable patients is a different story. Uh, so there are all sorts of different options um, and we've all got to do what's best for the patient. You know, I think there is an inherent conflict that interventionalists and cardiac surgeons have in that they do a procedure. Uh, in many cases, it generates their livelihood, but even if they're in healthcare systems where that's not directly the case, it generates other things like prestige and power in the hospital and so forth, at least in the US healthcare system. In, in most hospitals, the interventional cardiologist and the cardiac uh, surgeon generate most of the profit margin of the hospital. It's all cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, everything else is losing money in the hospital for the most part in the US healthcare system. And in other regions of the world, proceduralists do, do generate at a minimum prestige in general, also at least indirect, if not direct income. So, you know, those conflicts are inherent, but, but the bigger conflict isn't even that. My belief is that the bigger conflict is every physician is really trying to do what's best for their patient. And it's hard for a physician to ever think they're doing something that's not benefiting their patient. So, you know, they often will uh, interpret the data in a way that is aligned with what they're doing. I, I think the speakers here today have, have interpreted the data very accurately and fairly. And it's a little bit of a complex data set, but it's not as complex as we make it out to be in many cases. So I think cardiologists, first of all, have to be uh, a little bit honest in assessing the totality of data. That is, we've adapted dual antiplatelet therapy pretty broadly but that doesn't actually reduce mortality in most cases other than ST elevation MI, it reduces myocardial infarction. So a strategy that reduces myocardial infarction but not mortality has been embraced. A drug eluting stents versus bare metal stents don't clearly reduce mortality. Sure, if you meta-analyze the data, look at select trials, maybe, but the totality of the data doesn't show an impact on mortality. It reduces revascularization or repeat revascularization, but we felt that was important enough to wholesale switch from bare metal stents to drug eluting stents. So we have to be consistent when the cardiac surgeon says, look, cabbage is reducing MI, it's reducing revascularization, to not turn around and say, oh, those aren't important endpoints. The only endpoint that matters is mortality. I mean, you know, that's not internally consistent. So the reduction in MI and in revascularization with cabbage uh, versus PCI is important. Uh, and, uh, you know, the mortality issue, one can debate because I do think the length of follow-up matters. And, and Dr. Taggart made a good point. I mean, in general, especially in the Western world, left main disease isn't just traveling by itself. There's a bunch of multivessel disease there. There's often concomitant LV dysfunction. 
there's often concomitant diabetes. And in those sorts of patients that are good surgical candidates, especially if it, they're at the younger end of the age spectrum with a you know, long projected lifespan, yeah, I think their cabbage uh, is the winner. Uh, the data are actually uh, pretty clear if one wants to interpret them you know, completely uh, unobjectively. Now that doesn't mean in a patient that's 80 with a projected lifespan of a few years because they've got cancer mm -hmm. or something else. I mean, there, you know, you got to do what you got to do. And many times PCI or medical therapy, you know, might be the more uh, appropriate sort of thing to do. So the other key point was some data that was shown from a Dr. Park study where the location matters. So in mm -hmm. East Asia, you know, osteo and mid shaft disease is a bit more common in the West. In the West, other than radiation-induced disease or the occasional spasm that's misdiagnosed, it's a you know catheter-induced spasm that's misdiagnosed as left main. Most of the left main we see is distal bifurcation disease, and most of the time there's other bad disease there. So yeah, if you've got an isolated osteo left main, you're pretty sure it's not catheter-induced spasm. I'd go ahead and stent it. But in general, I think if there are two equal patients that aren't at particularly high surgical risk, stroke risk, multiple comorbidities, uh, very advanced age, limited life expectancy in general with their consent and speaking with them about all the different risks and benefits, including the points Dr. Holmes made about, you know, earlier discharge, getting back to work sooner. You know, I, I think we have a responsibility generally to push them towards cabbage. If they refuse, well, then you got to do what you got to do again. So one of the issues, Deepak, those are terrific comments. One of the issues is who should present the data to the patients? Certainly, um, if it's an interventional cardiologist, may be presented somewhat differently than if a cardiovascular surgeon. Or is there always room for a primary person that is not as vested, sort of the primary cardiology caregiver, to present it in a more unbiased, um, less nuanced fashion. And that has important implications. Certainly in many institutions, the cardiologist does the catheterization. The cardiologist then goes to talk with the patient afterwards in the family, and then a decision might be made in that. In some in other institutions, the identification of a left main in the cath lab, um, the cardiologist then says, well, we should at least have the surgeon review. In that circumstance, you rarely see the patient back. So I, I think that there are lots of different issues as we think about. Yeah. Um, Let me just jump in there and just say very quickly, that's one of the things we're very good at in the UK with our heart team approaches. So the vast majority of these patients would be discussed by a group of non-interventional cardiologists interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, a decision of what we are going to recommend to the patient will be recorded electronically and the basis for that recommendation. And that's what's presented to the patient, but it's still made to absolutely clear to the patient, this is the recommend this recommendation of a group of senior doctors. It doesn't mean to say the patient has to accept it. Now, let me jump there, there too. I mean, uh... Of course, for me, uh, bypass surgery PCI is almost my whole professional life. I start with uh, Sir Magdi Yacoub in the Cabri, then Arts, then Syntax, then Excel, it's, and it's not finished. I mean, with the fast track cabbage, we, we are opening a new avenue. But I think what was very strong at the Torak Center when I arrived, the Torak Center was just cardiologist and surgeon and engineer is that the heart team for me already in the 70s was something absolutely essential in the discussion. And many times I was seeing the patient with the surgeon. Of course, we had a corded or a dialogue before going to the patient so that there will not be a debate in front of the patient. But we were talking to physician, a surgeon and an interventional cardiologist to the patient. You know, the concern that I had in my whole life, I mean, uh, and it's a long experience, is the black and white, the yes, yes. and the binary. That's not the way it is. I mean, all this effort to do the syntax code, which is 16 years old, is that when the people were telling me, when the fellow was telling me, Prof, you have tomorrow a three vessel disease, I knew that there was three vessel disease and three vessel disease. And the rest, the whole development 
putting the comorbidity, putting the functionality, etc., is, is an attempt to have some kind of holistic view of the patient and then be able to share something which is not an opinion based on something. There is a bifurcation, there is a diabetes, there is the age. No, to try to put something together, make a prediction, and we are not mathematician, uh, but make a prediction so that at least with the surgeon and with the family, you could give some idea. Still today, I'm surprised to see when we make this calculation that the interventional cardiologist and the surgeon doesn't realize that some of these patients will be death by 10 years. I mean, the prediction for mortality is in the 50s, 60s, which is the reality. This is what we have seen in the 10 years mortality. So I think that the holistic view, trying to combining everything sure. the best we can, that's the message. That's what I've heard partially from David, but from the others also. Okay. I, okay. Okay. I got some, all right, great, uh, you know, a speed uh, from the, you know, Patrick and David is really, thank you for, uh, you know, comprehensive talk. And David, uh, anyways, in, in first talk, for the multi-vessel disease concern, PCI pulse bypass surgery, we have many uh, limited data. You know, the syntax study, even freedom trials. Uh, actually, they use the, you know, taxes to stay inside for taxes. It's very, you know, first generation of DS. The concept was totally different in real our practice. The meaning is the issue of uh, you know, completely vascularization concern. If you look at uh, some Bangladesh data, the New York Registry is our best trials. We use the uh, giants, second shot generation of the real thing stand, uh, totally separate with a uh, completely vascularization and incomplete vascularization, mainly derived repeated vascularization and spontaneous MI, actually mainly related with the uh, incomplete vascularization. It, it's not really, you know, uh, right, that's a first concern. And second one, recent practice, uh, Patrick has also, you know, some published a syntax two study, something like that. Pretty much change it in technical point of view. It's austere, sharp to the main, and even bifurcation stand procedure, totally different so from the, you know, old randomized, even, even in the Excel, it's been recent, uh, it's recent study. Look at it, I decided, and functional concept, right? It, it, you've changed a lot, you know? Even in the multi-vessel, the three-vessel disease, you know that the Tonino's data, three-vessel angiographic disease, just 14% of really, you know, they are, they are really three-vessel disease, right? Totally different concept. So the syntax two study, I really uh, like that one. So if you combine the imaging, Effective stain area, big vessel, we're gonna have you know, five millimeters in you know, a stain area, the repeat reverse cross less than two percent. It's totally different, you know, interventional technique and function. If you combine with the FFR concept, even in the old data, the syntax a piece with the Texas stain, totally you know comparable with the conventional bypass surgery, right? And so I really uh, uh, we, we've learned really some, you know, some studies from the best trials, so totally uh, different, different with the repeated vascularization and spontaneous MI mainly related with the incomplete vascularization. So mm -hmm. I really would say uh, in real practice, uh, we totally, you know, uh, much, much changed a lot. And so even... EESC guideline for the main disease, uh, intermediate, low to side syntax scores, and still, you know, to be to a, you know, uh, uh, a PCI. The meaning is syntax, Patrick know that, both follow the complex disease so for the little bias. And so they, the reason why Patrick added the clinical, you know, variables for that. And, uh, it, the complex, uh, high syntax scores mainly related with the multi-vessel disease. Yeah. Uh, even in the, our pre-combat data, it's almost 80% uh, of cases and two to three vessel disease. It's not simple, you know, a patient's uh, suburb, right? So uh, total syntax score 26, 
totally, we have no idea is a complete bus strategy and incomplete bus strategy. And so uh, I believe current issue is okay. However, in the, you know, I am one of the extreme, you know, interventionist side that you are the extreme cardiac social side. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, technical development and drug things stand getting better. I think we need a totally different, you know, a uh, randomized style based on the different concept. That is my uh, suggestion. If I can just make two very brief comments. The first thing I'd say is, as Dr. Holmes said in his introduction, coronary artery disease is a progressive disease. And I think the thing that many cardiologists still do not get their heads around is that no matter how good your stent is, and the stent technology has improved dramatically, but no matter how good your stent is, you're placing it relatively proximally and it has got no yeah. prophylaxis against future disease development. Whereas yeah. if you've got a patent IMA, internal mammary artery on your LED, mm -hmm. at 20 years, the patencies are still 90%. So mm -hmm. that's why, and the only intervention ever we've ever done in, in coronary artery disease that's shown to make a difference to survival is having a patent mammary on your mm -hmm. LED. The second thing I'd say about PCI is, it, is it's a much higher risk of incomplete revascularization with PCI than with cabbage, and we know that's not good for the patient. So while I fully accept the advances we've seen in stent technology, Cabbage is achieving something really quite different. Yeah, yeah. Um, we haven't, John. We haven't heard from you. Thank you, David. Um, Sorry. I particularly yeah. enjoyed um, uh, the debates. I thought that Patrick and, and uh, David uh, Taggart did a tremendous job of representing the data uh, and the viewpoints. Um, uh, Dr. Holmes introduced it with. Uh, equipoise and, and uh, with a nuanced understanding. A couple of thoughts, um, and I took some notes as I was listening to these very erudite speakers. It seems to me very clear that interventional cardiology has evolved and continues to evolve very efficiently and very quickly. Technologies driven by billions of dollars of investment by industry have improved the iterative generations of stents, and each one is better than the past. Moreover, techniques for implanting those stents are improving, and they seem to be disseminated broadly very quickly. Cardiac surgery, on the other hand, has not evolved at the same pace. And that, frankly, is, I think, shameful for us surgeons. We are still trying to bring most of our colleagues on board with two mammary artery grafts. And yet there's a mountain of evidence, not a perfect body of evidence, but a pretty compelling body of evidence that two mammary arteries lead to better short, intermediate, and especially long-term outcomes than a single mammary artery. And Dr. Gaudino and others have demonstrated that um, a radial artery beats a vein graft in almost all scenarios so that multi or all arterial bypass grafting should be the norm, and yet it's on the order of 1% of cases performed globally. About 94% of all coronary bypass surgery in the United States of America is a single mammary artery and three, two or three vein grafts, which is not meaningfully different than how we performed coronary bypass surgery in 1975 when I was a teenager. That's not, that does not reflect well on cardiac surgeons. <clears throat> so I'm going to implore the cardiologists listening to this to help cardiac surgeons evolve. <clears throat> I know there've been some jokes about surgeons as slow to evolve. Um, there's some truth to that. Cardiologists can encourage the evolution and advancement of cardiac surgery by focusing referrals to surgeons who will provide at least two arterial grafts. If your patient comes back from a coronary bypass operation with one arterial graft, you should ask that surgeon why. That should not be the default. That should be an exceptional event driven by some particular clinical circumstance. It should not be the norm, not any longer, not in 2021. Patrick, when you um, discussed your uh, Syntaxes 2 2020 score, I downloaded the app. It's, it's brilliant. Um, there was one thing as I looked at it that I wondered about, though, because 
when you input um, the categorization of patient, it's either three vessel disease or left main coronary disease. And yet much of our discussion today has been about how those two things travel together. And we can debate whether it's 60% of left main patients globally have two or three vessel disease or whether it's 90%, but it's certainly not an either or, or scenario. So I love the app. It's a great gen one, but we should somehow include uh, uh, the reality that those two things uh, travel together. Let me do a short, a short <laughs> comment on that. I mean, you, you make a very good point. So this uh, dichotomy between uh, left main and three vessel disease has been there in the history forever. Uh, it is somewhat two different animal, although there is a continuum. So if you look at the syntax score 2020, these great epidemiologists that I've been working with could not separate these things. So on one hand, you have the syntax score, which is taking the whole coronary artery disease, including the main stem and the three vessel. And then you have as another effect modifier, the, the main stem and the, uh, and the three vessel disease. That, that's pure mathematic, to be honest, but you're right. I mean, they, it's still there, it's still there. One of the comments that we've heard from many speakers is the notion that long-term follow-up helps to delineate the relative benefit of these two alternative therapies. And that, of course, is most relevant for patients who are likely to live a long time, because as Dr. Holmes points out, mortality in coronary surgery is inevitable eventually, in coronary, coronary disease. So that drives me back to a comment that I've made many times. I think we perform too much PCI in young patients, especially diabetic patients. And I think we perform too much coronary bypass surgery in the very elderly. They have different goals for their life, as Patrick and David Holmes have commented on. The quality of life, what their aspirations are, they're different. The 50-year-old diabetic male should have three arterial grafts, and he will live 30 years. The 85-year-old lady who just wants to be able to get on the telephone and talk to her grandchildren, she doesn't need complete revascularization. She may do just fine with medical management, but a coronary bypass may take six months for her to fully recover from, and her life expectancy is three years. So I think we need to be thinking again about not just the syntax score, but, and not just the STS score, but the patient's goals for their life at different stages of their lives. Yeah, Don, that is terrific. We're getting close to the end of this incredibly good session. We haven't heard from Michael. Um, Michael, can you then sort of wrap this up in terms of how you put all of this incredibly good, relevant information together to, to uh, make a, a common approach? You're a common sense guy. So bring this home. Uh, <laughs> Try to do it in two, three minutes. Actually, I think all the scientific data have been exchanged. I, I think there is a common sense. And if we look at our heart team discussions, I think we are very close by between interventional cardiology and um, surgery. That's not an issue. Um, I would bring one additional point, which usually is, is not well addressed, which is the point of the patient. So consider you are the patient, consider somebody's going to tell you, you have left main disease, plus minus additional um, a disease downstream, and somebody tells you, you need surgery. This is the best you need. Your question is, where do I get the best surgery in my neighborhood? So the question, the key question is, can we, what has been generated in all these elegant trials, extrapolate to our daily life in center A, B, C, D, E? And even if you go to these centers, can we extrapolate these to operator A, B, C, D, E? This is something, we're all aware of the bubble chart from the syntax trial, the one that not has been shown very often, but which is one of the most important ones, at least from my point, if I would be a patient, to take, to take the decision, if I need that treatment, which is recommended to me, where do I need to go? Which center? 
and that center, which is the best operator I can get, because this is something we have to look at. And this totally fits into the environment. And David, you addressed that into, in your introductory note, is also addressing the global healthcare system because the secondary prophylactic therapy, et cetera, et cetera, if we look at MACE rates, not only at one year, but at five years, even at 10 years. So this is something where I personally feel we have a lot of work open, a lot of data to, to offer to our patients, which are maybe more relevant to the patient than only the discussion on should we do surgery or should we do PCI in the individual patient. That's my particular personal summary. How, how does that um, stand, Dr. Doku Park? We haven't heard from you. Yeah, so I, I think the, uh, one of uh, the, as a host of the, this virtual session, I'm, uh, I think this session is the, the one of wonderful session is balanced with the worldwide famous uh, uh, cardiac surgeon and the worldwide famous interventional cardiologist as uh, also the general cardiologist. I think. Uh, I'm really grateful to everyone and give lecture and discussion. I cannot hear anywhere the else, and I think this is very, you know, interesting educational and to all audience uh, the participating our TCT 2020 virtual meeting. Really appreciate all the of the, the lecture and the panel discussion. Thank you, Mario. <laughs> Mario, do you want to just give your final comment? Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, uh, that was a terrific session. Uh, thank you to the TCTAP organizer for uh, putting this together. I think uh, in the end, uh, the message is always the same. It's consistent. I don't think there is any real debate. It's just a matter of uh, 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 individualizing uh, the treatment strategy to the patient. And I agree to the operator and to the local expertise. So I think I can say that I thank everybody for being uh, 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 with us uh, uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. And I look forward to see you, you all in person when all this uh, will be over. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Great. Great.